Okay. Uh, English, or? Uh, I, I, was, I was ready to do German, and then I was asked to do English, so now I'm pretty set on English. But what do you think? Is okay? English okay? German? Okay. Um, well, I'll, 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 I'll do it in English. Um, thank you for inviting me and giving me the chance to give a talk about my work. Um, when Regina first contacted me months ago about the idea of giving a talk at the Photo Book Festival, um, actually Mikhail contacted me first and wanted me, sort of put me in the position of wanting to talk about photo books in some sort of um, theoretical way and I immediately mentioned that I, I'm not I'm a, I'm a passionate photo book collector, but I'm not an expert on photo books. And I read names that are on the panels from Shaden and company, and I'm not going to stand up here and be a, a photo book uh, expert. So I thought what I'm going to do is maybe go in the other direction of something uh, theoretical, and I'm going to tell, tell a very personal story. And I started thinking about my own work and how my autobiography is such a pivotal part of everything I do, Yet my photographs, when you look at them, they seem to be very straight documentary photographs. So I started thinking about this, this gray zone between the autobiographic work, a document, and for me, the truth is sort of somewhere in between. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna start with early work, talk about how I kind of come to my work, and the whole process is gonna always be based on my own autobiography, and it, I, I, I came up with the idea from a quote that I really like from Henry Vessel, who said that uh, in photography, everything's been done, but you've never been done. And that sounds a bit kitschy, but the idea is that everything has been photographed, so if you're looking for a place to start that hasn't been photographed, a good place to start is usually your own biography. And um, uh, I'm gonna start with really early work from the late 80s, and I was first introduced to photography through classical American landscape photography. My, pho my father was a hobby photographer, and we had books of Ansel Adams laying on the table. And I thought they were beautiful, but for me it was actually a bit abstract. I didn't, I didn't find it emotional in any way, and, and my early experience of photography was just searching for this pristine landscape and I n somehow knew that it didn't really exist. Well, when I started to study photography at Arizona, I had the, 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 yeah, the, 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 the luck of my main professor being Bill Jenkins, and he had just curated the new topographics exhibition. So suddenly, I call it my Adams moment, when I realized that I couldn't do anything with Ansel Adams, but Robert Adams changed my life. And when I, when I realized that uh, this work that people like Lewis Baltz and Robert Adams were doing, suddenly I saw a landscape that I could really identify with. This is what Phoenix looked like. This is what my, my neighborhood looked like where I grew up. And I thought, this is a landscape that I can walk into, that I can identify with. And it was through the new topographics photographers where I found a, an entrance into photography. And I, I always disagreed with the fact when people said the new topographics photographers weren't emotional. For me, they were very emotional. So my, my early work in photography looked like this. It was black and white. I was very much interested in the myth of the American West. Mark Klett was also one of my professors who was highly influential of, of how we approach the landscape and the postmodernist approach to the landscape and how the landscape we know today has been filtered through society. Um, I'm just going to show a few pictures of this early work. I would, I would wander the deserts with black and white film. People always ask me, why black and white? Why color now? And I always say I made black and white at the time because that was the medium that we, that we used. That was the medium that as a young student you could, process, you could shoot the film, you could develop the film, you could print the film. Color photography wasn't so accessible to sort of the average photography student at the time. So the choice to, to use black and white was simply a, a pragmatic choice of wanting to have a medium that I controlled to the end. Um, this work all happened more or less when I was a student from 86 to 91. And then um, something really, probably the most pivotal part of my entire life happened in 1991. And um, at the time, I didn't know that it would change my life so much, nor did I think it would change my photographic um, position so much. But in 1991, I moved from this landscape, which was the landscape I grew up in, um, to this landscape. And when I show this lecture, like in Ohio, it's really a funny moment. And when you show this lecture 
in Salzburg or Vienna, it's not so fantastic. But this is a very different landscape than what I grew up in. And um, suddenly in 1991, I moved to Salzburg. I had fallen in love with an Austrian woman. We'll get that question out of the way now. Um, moved to Salzburg. Um, I was fresh out of the university. I finished like top in my class. I, I won this scholarship from Kodak where they were sending me film for a year. And all of my friends and colleagues said, oh, you're moving to the most beautiful city in the world. You're just going to go crazy. You're going to photograph like crazy. And it was a super frustrating time for me because I spent the first three or four, five years in Salzburg and I didn't photograph. I very quickly became friends with all of uh, the colleagues at Photohof, which I'm still now a part of. And I, I was still involved in fine art photography. And I was very much into the gallery, but I wasn't photographing. And it was very frustrating for me, and I didn't know why. I, I would try. I would try to walk through the city with a camera, and it, it just didn't work. And um, it was on a trip back to America in about 1995, 96. My parents sold their house, and they asked me to come back home and help sort of clean out my junk. And I was going through some drawers, and I found this photograph that I hadn't looked at in years. And this is a portrait of me. I was 11 years old at the Grand Canyon in 1979. And um, as soon as I saw, I hadn't thought of this picture in, in 15 years. As soon as I saw this picture, I was immediately taken back to this, to this, that very moment of when that photograph was made. My father made it, and. Um, he said, oh, go stand over there next, that'll look nice. And I'm, of course, I'm, I'm, I'm standing up here. And he's, oh no, come on, step down, get down to lower. And uh, <laughs> it's, it's terrifying. Literally, the, this goes down to the bottom of the Grand Canyon. Now, if you, if you go to this same place now, there's a, there's a glass wall around here. You can't, even, you can't even do this anymore. And I saw this, and I was, I was interested in the way that all of these wilderness, this, this danger, sort of immediately came back through a photograph. And it, interestingly enough, and this is going to kind of be a line through my whole lecture today, I, was, I, I took a family snapshot from decades pre prior to bring me to the point where I knew what I had to photograph. I saw this and it immediately took me back to my childhood. And this photograph was made on the day before my father and I did our first rafting trip through the Grand Canyon. And I have to mention that because it's important, again, for my autobiography, for my biography. My childhood was filled with all these like adventure sports. My father was a rafter. We went rafting, rock climbing, fishing, hunting. It shocks most Europeans when I tell them that um, when I was a teenager, I owned three guns. And we would go duck hunting and shoot things. And we would walk out in the desert and build a fire and sleep on the ground. And up until I moved to Europe, this was sort of a part of just how we spent our summers. And I thought, that's it. I want to go camping in, in Europe. I want to start camping again. I want to find this sort of um, relationship that people have to the wilderness. I knew that you couldn't go camping in Europe the way we did in Arizona. You can't just walk into the Alps and build a fire and sleep on the ground. But I went back to Austria in about 97, I guess, with this picture. And I told my wife, I said, let's go camping. And it, um, the... <laughs> The camping culture in Austria is so infinitely different than what I remembered from my childhood. I was fascinated with this, though. Of course, I was turned off by it. I wasn't interested in this kind of wilderness experience. But I thought, that's it. That's my first European work is going to be based on my, my childhood, which was about sort of always seeking adventure and an exchange with nature. And I'm going to like push it to the other extreme, and I'm going to do a project in, in the Alps, originally. And I started a project that then, five years later, became the book um, Natura Deluxe. And um, the Grand Canyon picture is even in here, kind of as a little starting point. And um, I'll, I'll, I'll just, I'm going to read the brief text here, because I, I got it right that time, and there's no reason to stumble around again. Um, an important part of my childhood in Arizona were the camping trips we would take. In America, especially in the West, one can simply put on a backpack, walk into the wilderness, catch a fish, build a fire, and sleep on the ground. Wilderness experience had much to do with adventure, being challenged, and being scared. When I moved to Europe in the late 80s, I quickly realized that the wilderness in Europe has been filtered through centuries of history and tradition, and that the camping culture is far from the unpredictable and direct exchange with nature. The world of the camper is one of comfort, predictability, and a desperate attempt at a, way, at a home away from home. 
While people may long for the simple, carefree life in the midst of nature, they evidently find it impossible to live easily without comfort, safety, and cleanliness. It's the search for the true wilderness experience caught between the urge to be free and the need for security. So that was kind of my starting point. I had a car that I could sleep in the back, and I initially had the UMTC, which is, everybody knows that, um, ADAC in Germany. They were on my side as a bit of a sponsor. They didn't quite know what I was going to do, but they, they, they sent out to every registered camping ground in the Alps, they sent out a postcard for me explaining who I was and what I wanted to do, and there was a little answer card they could send back. And I actually, we sent out about 480 of them, and I got back 120 positive responses of campgrounds that said, please come and photograph our place. And this was very important in Austria because, I, I don't have to tell you, but you like drive up to some place and you have, want to explain your project. It's like, what do you want to do? And well, this is all private property and we're not quite sure, but this made things easier because I could pull up to a campground and they already knew I was coming. So I, I planned over the course of several summers, I planned little week-long trips where I could visit six, seven, eight campgrounds. And it, it's a quite simple way of working. I was do, here I was doing everything with Hasselblad. So I had a camera on a tripod. I, this was actually what I traveled with. It was my table and chairs. So there wasn't, I didn't have a tent. And I would start wandering through these campgrounds looking for still lifes, landscapes, portraits. And this, this became a, a real sort of standard way of that still continues through my work is this kind of creation of a, of a narrative through combining portraits, still lifes, landscapes, to want to, I always say to, to, tell, to tell a story, but that's maybe not right, but I think to tell my story. And that's kind of where the title of my talk came in, the idea of you have your autobiography, you have that photographic document, and I think the truth is maybe somewhere in between. Um, especially in some of my later work, it, it, it's, it's camouflaged as being super objective documentary photography, but I always say there's nothing really objective about the way I work. I'm very selective about where I set up the camera. The editing becomes a very subjective process. So, yeah, so I was camping for, mm, yeah, four and a half summers. I think the book represents uh, 72 campgrounds after 120 nights camping. And uh, this, this, this was the first project that I did that I, um, was the f I, 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 was, I was young. It was the first project I'd ever done in my life where I experienced what it's like when a project is over. And that happened um, one summer when I was photographing. And I think any photographer in the room knows this experience. You look through the camera and you say, oh, this is a fantastic photo. I'm going to push the button. And it gets to a point where you realize it's a fantastic photo because you've already made it. I, and I would look through, and I, I started making the same pictures over and over. And this idea of having to realize you don't need to make that picture because you've already made that. And um, that's when I decided to stop. And I found uh, a local publisher in Salzburg, the Pustet Verlag, and we um, made this book. So the book came out in 2004 in the summer. And, of course, it was like my first big project, and like all the photographers in the room, you make this book and you think, oh, this is fantastic, I'll never do anything like this in my life. Again, this is like, th this is the best it gets. And um, so I sort of went into the fall having no idea what I was going to do next. And the, the, the what I ended up doing was so different than this. My sister, um, who still lives in Arizona, contacted me. This became the next book, it's titled Higley which is um, the name of a town where my grandparents are from. It's a farming community on the outskirts of Phoenix. Um, and my sister contacted me and said, yeah, we, we've moved back to Higley and we've bought a house. And I, I, couldn't, I couldn't envision that because this is the Higley of my childhood. My grandparents lived in a house like this. This isn't their house, but um, Higley was this farming community way outside of town. There was nothing there but farming fields and I couldn't understand how my sister had moved there. And she said, no, you have to come and visit. Higley is completely changing. It's becoming like the new yuppie uh, gated communities of Phoenix. So I went to visit, no camera. Well, I had a camera with me, but I wasn't planning on photographing. So I went to visit her and I was completely shocked because this Higley that I knew out of my childhood, which looked like this, where my grandparents were, was, was slowly, or was quickly disappearing. They were building houses everywhere. 
And when I was back in the fall of 2004, I told my father, I said, I want to go visit the old house of my grandparents before it gets torn down. It was still standing, but they hadn't lived there in several years, or in a couple years. So we went to the house, and we're walking, it's completely empty, and because uh, they weren't sure for a while if they were going to sell it or if it would be torn down. We're walking through the living room, and I come into the living room, and this photo board is sitting just like this, and this photo board has been a part of my entire life. This board is older than I am. This is me when I'm a baby. Um, this is my parents' wedding picture, my grandparents' wedding picture, um, my mother. And it used to be completely covered with photographs. Well, when my grandmother moved out, they took all the photographs away that were on with tape, but the original ones from the 70s were actually glued on, so they couldn't take them. So I kind of walked into the living room, and I said, oh, you, you forgot the, the photo board. And they said, oh, nobody wants that. They're, they're just going to tear that down with the house. They're going to throw that away. And th that, that, that completely shocked me. I thought, how can you do that? And, and my father, who was there, said, oh, you're too sentimental because you live in Europe now. And, but, uh, <laughs> but we see each other every day. No, nobody wants this old thing. Do you want it? And I said, well, I, I, I did take it. But um, I, I was kind of in a trance. And I walked out to the car. And I got the camera, set it up on a tripod. I opened one window kind of on the other side of the room. And I took a picture. It's the only picture I took of that entire trip to Arizona. Um, I didn't know what to do with this. I got back home, went over through the winter of 2004, and this picture was always kind of haunting me. Uh, the house was then gone, and I thought, this, this is odd, this, this, this American dream that my grandparents envisioned. They were, they were, they were um, milk farmers, um, looked much different than this dream that my sisters now have in Higley, Arizona. So this picture became the catalyst for what I ended up doing the next four years. I said, okay, I'm gonna document the changing of this community from the farming community of my childhood to the yuppie community that my sisters now live in. I usually don't do this in an exhibition, but this, this tells the project in two pictures. I, I could turn the computer off after I show these two pictures. But this photograph was made in 2005 when I started photographing, and this one was made in 2007 from the same tripod spot, as best as I could figure it out. So these two pictures exemplify what happened to Higley. This is the certain sort of American dream that my grandparents had. This also isn't their house. Um, but this is how their house looked and the farming community around it. And this is what it looks like now. Sort of around the corner to the left is where my sister lives. And my sister's much younger than me. And she didn't even, for her, it wasn't even ironic that she lives on the same ground that my grandparents used to farm, you know, 25, 30, 40 years later. And it, 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 uh, it, she kind of doesn't register that. Um, so I decided I'm just going to photograph this change. And I had a young daughter at the time, so I wanted to travel to Arizona a lot. And I started, I went twice a year for four years. And I, it's quite simple. I would start just roaming around Higley. Higley's not huge. It's only about two by two and a half kilometers, uh, two by three kilometers. I would borrow my mom's car. I would get up very early because of jet lag, which is great if you're photographing in a farming community because you meet some farmer and you want to make a portrait. And he says, oh, but you know, we're out working at five in the morning. And I'm like, okay, I'll be there, 4.30, whatever. You're fit. And uh, um, so I would travel around Higley and I would just kind of meet the older farming community that was still there and make their pictures. But at the same time, I was also trying to keep up with the stuff that was disappearing and also photographed the new. And I'll, I'll just flip through the pictures a little bit. It's not, um, it's not a highly sort of conceptual work. It's very, very based in a yeah, very social documentary approach to photography, very straight. Um, I, I do use some um, portable lighting to kind of smooth things out in the interiors, but it's not a very dramatic lighting. And I would knock on doors of these older houses and it didn't take long to explain my project because the people who were there saw it coming. They, they were excited even that somebody was even interested. Um, this guy became very, uh, not this guy, <laughs> uh, the, guy who, the guy whose bedroom this is, it comes a little bit later, I'll show you him. Um, what's interesting for me is this house here was a house that I used to play in when I was about seven or eight years old. Uh, another boy who lived out there, this was his house. So actually in these rooms, I would, I would, when I would visit my grandmother, I would kind of disappear off to his house and um, um, play with him when I was about six, seven years old. So I could, go, I could go back and I could visit these houses and walk through the places as just before they were being torn down. And I'm, I'm not even breaking into them. Nobody cares anymore. The, the, um, you know, the bulldozers are just, you know, a few days later, this isn't there. 
I would approach people. This, this for me is such a pivotal portrait of the project. This guy is a, a, a local farmer's son, and she's a student at the university from um, Michigan, I think, studying at the Arizona State University. And they had met, and now this is for me is kind of the, a symbolic portrait of where that all sort of developed. And um, This is the kitchen of the man who became so important. Um, most of the people in the pictures, not, not the people of Hispanic descent, but most of the um, people in the, in the project are uh, family members or friends. This is the gentleman who, he was the local doctor in Higley. And he actually remembered, he was actually my father's doctor when my father was a younger guy. And I met him and he's very, very sort of intellectual and up and he, 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 he understood my project immediately and he opened so many doors. He knew everybody and meeting him became really important because he, he could say, oh, you need to go talk to them. And, you know, he'd make a phone call and then I would just be welcomed by everybody. Um, the, the actual process is maybe 50% 4 by 5 and 50% 6 by 7 the choice to use the 4x5 was never because of sharpness or something, but quite often if I wanted to purposefully slow down the process, or if sometimes if I wanted to correct perspective. But uh, now, if I was doing the project again, I would probably do it all 6x7. I, the the 4x5 um, <laughs> just ends up costing a lot of money, but there, there are certain images where it, it, um, it was important to have. And um, this is my sister in her lovely new pool. It, it, while I was working on this, I did it for about two or three years, and it was just a box of prints that were growing. And I, I, I mean, I like books, and I knew someday I would maybe like to do a book, but I was quite content with it being w a box that I just sort of hand to my kids. I knew someday my daughters were going to say, you know, what did it look like where you grew up? And I, I kind of felt like this was racing against time to try and show this. And um, I had the fortune of... Uh, this gallery that I now work with in Hamburg, Robert Morat, I showed it to him and he immediately liked it and he said, there's a, a guy coming to see me tomorrow. Um, can I show it to him? And I left it there and it was Kurt Salkli. I don't know, Kurt's not here, but uh, Kurt took it, gave it to Klaus Kera. Klaus Kera called me and then it became a book with Kera. I hadn't, I hadn't really um, pursued a, a publisher in, in that sense. So uh, the the idea of working with Kiera on a book happened before I was even finished with it, which had advantages and disadvantage, but da disadvantages, but in the end I was able to pull out more advantages than disadvantages from it. Um, in total, the, the total archive is maybe about a thousand images. In the book there are 80. Um, you know, when you're putting a book together, the editing becomes much different. It, it has to do with rhythm and, and storytelling, and that's what happens with a book, for example, in the book, this woman is, is placed next to a, a, a landscape that has absolutely nothing to do with her, but you immediately sort of make a relationship to her in that landscape. And that's what I was talking a little bit about, the, the putting a book together and working like this is by no means an objective process. It's a, very, it's a very subjective way of working, at least for me. I have a certain story that I want to tell, and I use images to tell my story. A lot of these places that are in this book, you'll, you'll recognize when I show the next book, which became the follow-up of this. I would photograph a lot of the same people in a lot of the same places. For example, this, this place gets repeated. Um, so I didn't know when to end this project. Um, I loved the idea of going to visit my sisters, and while I was there, having something to do. I would drive around Higley, and it was, I liked working like this. And I decided, what I had, I had to pick a day to end it. And I planned a trip so that I would be in Higley on May 28th, 2007, which was the last day that Higley was actually called Higley. The day after that, it had lost its um, zip code. It, it lost its name as a town, and now it's just a part of Phoenix. And that's also why I named the book Higley. I wanted it to be a little bit of an homage on the place. I also liked the name Higley because it's completely abstract, which has disadvantages because people always spell it and pronounce it wrong and um, call me and ask if they can have a copy of Hiley or Quigley or um, whatever. But it, 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 it's actually the name of the place. Hi, Wolfgang. I'm glad you showed up. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, yeah, I, I was, the other day I got a nasty SMS from my wife that she, she, couldn't, find, she, she couldn't find the bicycle pump. Where's the bicycle pump? But um, um, 
So I, I made this grand plan, and this was a little bit of a suggestion from Klaus. Klaus, I don't think he even made it here yet. I wanted, I wanted to talk to him about it. But um, w the book was already, this was my last trip then, and the book was already planned. People, we knew what it was going to look like. So I got on my last trip, I was just kind of filling holes. And we had this idea that on the last picture of the book should be a family portrait. I should get my whole family together. The project started with a family portrait board, so let's end it with a really classical family portrait. It was my last trip in Higley. I'd been there for th four weeks. I was tired. I wanted to stop. I shot a ton of film that I knew was going to cost a lot of money, and I only had 4 by 5 film left. So I set up the 4 by 5 camera in the garden, and I called all of my family who lived, still lived in Higley, aunts, uncles, cousins, my grandmother, and I said, I want to get together, and I want to um, I wanna make one family portrait to sort of memorize this last day of Higley. So we get everybody together, and they stand up, and um, uh, I have the 4 by 5 set up, and I just have this really old mechanical timer. You know, you sort of wind it over to 10 seconds, and then you hit uh, push, and it sort of counts down. Well, I made a mistake, and I only set it to 3 seconds. And of course, my daughter wanted to push the button with me, so we go up to the camera, and um, I've got everyone set up. The light's right. I was like, OK, I got one sheet of film. I'm not, I'm not going to do a bunch of this. I want to get it over with. Kids are crying, running around. Um, we push the button, and we start running to get in the picture. And the, the timer goes off, of course, when we're like halfway there. And, um, but we, you, you don't know this as you're running. You just, you, it kind of makes this silent little click. And so we're running and scrambling. And um, my daughter and I get in the back, and we stand. And I kind of count in my head you know, to 10. And I think, OK, it's done now. Come back to Austria developed the film, and he's like, oh, come on. He, like, I studied this. My dad's like, oh, you, you, how, I paid a lot of money for you to go to school, and this is what you, you know, <laughs> why, why can't you do this? And, and this, is, this is my father back there. Uh, he's, in, he's in the book as well. And this is my grandmother who started the whole thing. Um, so I, I scanned this quickly, low res, and I sent it to Kiera. I sent it directly to the book designer, and I said, Petra, I, I'm really sorry. I said, I tried, but... And she wrote back, she's like, I showed it to Klaus, it's already in the book, it's like the last picture, it's perfect. And I thought, at first I thought, no, you, you can't, and she said, no, it's exactly what it's all about. It's this, it's this attempt to try and keep everything together in sort of a classical way, but it just doesn't work. Everything's kind of falling apart. So this became the, the, the closing image in the book, and um, surprisingly, there have, I mean, I don't sell a ton of work, but when people have bought, like, little series of work in like a portfolio, twice people have insisted on having this print. And so I then had to come up with sort of a special edition and a special size, because I never saw it as a, as a work. Um, Mika and I talked about the idea of the difference between a picture and, a, and a, an image, and this for me wasn't an image, it was just a, you know, the difference between ein Foto and ein, ein Bild. But people saw this as, as an image that was important. And I thought, okay, so now there's a small edition of this, and I occasionally show it. Um, I wanted to talk about this briefly. I, I sort of skipped over this. This is a portrait of my grandparents that I've known since I was a little boy. And I was always fascinated with this because if you were standing across the room, you could totally see them. You could recognize who it was. And as you got closer, they disappeared. And I, what I think is, it, it's, a, it's like a quilting way. And I think it's what's quite interesting is it's the same way that we make digital photography these days, uh, with the idea of pixels. And uh, so also kind of an important image for me, but a very sort of silent one. Um, okay, so I finished this in 2007. Um, there were some shows and whatnot, and uh, had no idea what I was going to do, of course. This was like this epic thing for me, uh, closing off this sort of family story. And in 2008, something happened that just, again, changed everything, is that the housing market completely crashed. In 2008 was the huge subprime housing crash in America, where everybody who had moved, not everybody, most people who had moved to Higley bought a $400,000 house, even though they only earned $40,000 a year, bought these expensive houses. In, in the time that I photographed, Higley went from having nine homes to having o over 1,100 homes within four-year periods. The, the population went from 52 people living there originally to there being like 1,100 families living there. This completely crashed. Everything stopped overnight, and I thought, okay, what do I do now? This, I, I told this story of everything kind of evolving towards this new American utopia, and it completely stopped. So I thought, okay, I'll keep going. And from 2008 till 2012, I uh, worked on a second book 
and I don't have it here, but it's upstairs. It's this book here. It's called Haboob, which again, the people at CARE were a little frustrated that I was picking another very kind of cryptic, unpronounceable word as a title, but um, it, it works. If, you have, if both of them are cryptic, then it's, it's okay. And what I did is I started going back to Arizona, and I, I had, for me, I had solved this problem of having to tell my family's story. Now I started going to Arizona, and I started making the pictures that I somehow always wanted to make there. The pictures that in the back of my mind, after living in Europe for a while and seeing how, how history takes a long time to sort of build and the way Europe deals with um, communities that grow over centuries and o over generations, in Arizona, I always felt this is not gonna work. But I at the time, I was telling my family's story, so I, I couldn't be so critical. I started going back and photographing the same places um, it's all sort of central or centered around where my sister lives, but I wasn't tied to the fact of having to tell my, the story of my family, so I was much freer. This work visually is much looser than Higley. There, there are fewer portraits, um, and this picture shows really well what, what a haboob is. Haboob is the Arabic word for a violent dust storm. And this happens in certain parts of the world that grow too fast, and you have a lot of concrete, a lot of... Um, built areas that are sort of islands out in the desert. And these, 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 these concrete areas get very hot during the day. The air rises during the day, and then in the afternoon, the air gets cold and it falls really fast. So Arizona now is quite known for these haboobs, and they actually use the word haboob in Arizona, which for me is odd to be there. And I walk into the living room, and my brother-in-law, who's this very nice, but just very American guy, says, oh, there's another haboob coming. And I, I think it just sounds weird, this word kind of coming out of his mouth in this very sort of uh, conservative, Christian, white place. And they've adapted this so Arabic word uh, into their dialogue. And if you go to Wikipedia and you search Haboob, you get pictures of Baghdad, Riyadh, and Phoenix, Arizona. And I love that fact that, that this weather phenomenon is so democratic and just destroys any community that's, that's sort of big and flat and made out of concrete. This image on the TV I made out of my car with my iPhone. I got home, pushed it through Apple TV onto the TV. So it's a real photograph of the room, but it's not on TV at the time. Um, I'll flip through these a little bit. There are not as many images as, as Higley. Like I said, Higley, I would wake up in the morning and I knew, okay, I have an appointment with this farmer, I'm going to this construction site, I knew what I was doing. In Higley, I would drive around and work much more intuitive and I would find places that for me were a bit, a bit haunting or a bit um, where I just thought, There's, this is, something's not right here. And the work for me, if I have to describe it afterwards, it's very much about facade and artificiality and, and a sustainability that's not really gonna hold. These places are built out of Preschbahnplatten and um, they then spray some poots over it and then paint it. Th these aren't places that you can renovate in 40 years. I gave this lecture um, in Poland um, several months ago, and I was always explaining this as being the, um, the very, this was the social documentary work for me, and the Higley work was the very personal work. And this, this young Polish girl stood up afterwards and she said, you're completely wrong. This work is the real personal work and Higley was the very social documentary. And at first I didn't, I didn't want to admit that, but she was completely right. When I was in Higley, I, I was working as a, as a social documentary photographer. I was trying to tell the story of this community. And here I'm, I'm making the work about the way I sort of feel in that landscape, which is a bit uncomfortable and a bit, um, um, not quite sure what to make of the place. It was during this work that I really realized, I mean, this sounds kitschy as well, but it's during this work that I realized that I'm not, I'm not, I'm not American anymore in a, in a sort of a, a visual, cultural way. That this is the first work, also happened to be timed with the moment in my life where I've spent more of my time, my life in Europe than in America. That happened in 2010. I also never, a lot of people when they see this work, they're surprised that there's so many sort of beautiful places like this. And they're like, oh, I imagined this was gonna be a bunch of crying people being kicked out of their houses and you know, sofas thrown out on the street. I wasn't interested in that. There's people telling that sort of heart-wrenching personal story. I was more also interested in the fact that there's still people like this who live here. There, if you have money, you can buy huge houses there and you can build this little island of paradise in the middle of nowhere. 
And this is the case in, in this situation where um, probably a house that five years ago was like over a million dollars you could buy for about $250,000. And so people who had money were buying these, and they were happy to sort of live in this, this kind of odd place. And, but, ac but across the street, there are five houses like this that, where the door hasn't been opened in, in eight months. So again, my sister, and she lives in this place where when she first moved there, they had these, they have families are going to move here, and there's going to be, we're going to live in this huge community, and now th they're still kind of on this island of, of nothing and so people move there who have a lot of money but they don't have they haven't got any time invested in the place so they buy things like these plastic um, Greek statues because this is an aesthetic that we know is this is something of value this is something classical but it's, um, it's you know made out of plastic and uh, placed in this this space so these are the things that as, as a photographer and a, a bit of sort of a critical vision that I'm interested in photographing and um, Haboob has become sort of chapter two. This is again the doctor. I revisited him all the time. This is a quite also f a, a politically loaded image because uh, Higley borders on the Navajo Indian Reservation and between Higley and Mexico are, is an expanse amount of land of the Navajo Indian Reservation. And this guy lives directly on the northern border of the Indian Reservation and he's very provocatively named his ranch north of nowhere, which is a, a really um, ugly thing to say. He's basically saying everything south of here doesn't exist. And in it's unfortunately still a, um, a strong sort of feeling there. I'm very much interested in these, uh, these ideas of sort of uh, a bit of luxury that's, you know, if you, if you look at the top of this picture, it could be Beverly Hills, and if you look at the bottom, it's just, um, you know, it could be some, you know, poverty-torn place. And I, I like the way that this luxury item is kind of being presented like a, a piece of jewelry, but, um, yeah. There's another phenomenon happening there with churches. You can, people are losing their houses, but there's a tax break you can get if you're a church because then you're like a farine. So people would fu uh, found churches. And you can, you'll be driving down a corner and you, down here you can go to the New Hope Church of Faith, the Santan Baptist Church, and you, you follow these signs and it's just a house. And you, you knock on the door and just some mom opens it and you say, is this the church? Oh yeah, come on Sunday, you can come on in but you can't go in then, and every, I think they have to meet once a month, and somebody has to write a protocol, and I don't know what they do if they even, maybe they just drink coffee, but as, as if you're a church, they get sort of a two-year um, schonfrist where they save on taxes or something, so th there's this, des this desperate attempt to kind of save your house, and people are founding churches. At the same time, the Mormon church has built the largest temple outside of Salt Lake City, is now standing on a corner, in the middle of nowhere in, in what used to be Higley, Arizona. And it's just this, this massive, and they've built it there because they said they have just this huge onslaught of, of interest in the Mormon church, and more people are joining the church now than ever before. So they're in the middle of nowhere. They've built this like almost fascist looking bunker um, to, yeah. It's when you get close to it, it's, um, and you, you can't, it's being built right now. You can't physically get close to it. I tried to drive up and um, photograph, and they asked me if I was a member of the church. I should have said yes, but then I don't know if you would ask me for, you know, some kind of ID or, I don't know, a secret handshake or something. I don't know, but I, I said, I said, um, I said, no, I just would like to make some photographs, and no chance, but of course you can stand across the street and make it. The, the, my cover of the image of the book, I always wanted. I knew this is what I wanted, and it, it's in America. It's it's read much differently. These, um, when you buy a house there, the key ring is a Pantone block, and there you're the immobilian person hands you the keys, you unlock the door, you go inside, and the idea on the back is the advertising for a painter. So you walk in, you can pick out all your dream colors of your new dream house, and then you can call the painter. And it's, uh, there's absolutely nothing staged about this photograph, although it, it could have been staged, and it's just kind of on the side of the road, these, 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 this key ring had been just sort of thrown out of the car window. It probably just blew out of the garbage or something, but this is me stopping there and saying, no, this, this, this has something symbolic for me. And again, this is that I, this idea of me trying to tell my story. Um, I, I don't know the history of these colors, of how they actually ended there, but um, 
that's sort of my sort of constructed stories that I'm trying to tell. This is again the, the same garden where there was a little cardboard house. The next generation has kind of moved in. Yeah, and it ends with actually the last storm that I photographed um, there. Let's see how we're doing on time. Oh, good. Because I, I want to show one project, another book, um, that I wanted to break, I wanted, wanted to show that there are things that happen in between the very personal projects that I actually got a commission work to do that at first I was a bit skeptical because a woman, a curator from Japan, saw a show of Higley and she contacted me and said, you have to come to Japan, we have a place that looks just like Higley. And I thought, I can't imagine that, but of course I wanted to go to Japan. And it was this uh, European Eyes on Japan series, some of you might know it. They, a museum in Japan invites a European photographer, she was able to get me in as a European photographer, to Japan to, to just photograph for three weeks in one area. So she sent me to Niigata. The title of my project is not Niigata, but that will be explained a little bit later. And it was the most intense three weeks of photographing of my life. It was the winter, it was February. And I was there for exactly 21 days, and I photographed for 19. So there was a day from the airport to Tokyo, and then the next day straight to Niigata, photograph nonstop, back to Tokyo on a plane and fly. It was winter, it was cold, and, but I had complete freedom. And I didn't know what to do with the place. I thought, I don't know what to do. I have, and, and leading up to the project, the curator kept asking me, well, what do you want to do? Do you want to do a story about the rice farming? That would be interesting for you. Or how about you do something about, you know, building of houses? And I kept saying, Higley's a very personal project. I, I, I'm not going to go to Niigata and photograph that. And they picked me up at the airport, and this was the sign. And I, as, I, as I was approaching it, I thought, that's exactly it. It's this idea of quite, not, quite, not quite understanding it or, or something just being off just a little bit. And um, so I asked him if I could have the sign. And this is from the airport, you know, heading to the hotel. And I just laid it on the dashboard and made this snapshot. And um, so I decided as I'm going through Japan, I would react to scenes and moments that reminded me of Higley. I had just come off of Higley. I had just finished Higley, so it was very fresh. The way of working, it was the same cameras, the same process. I would go through the landscape there that I didn't understand. And I would, I would make images that spoke to me based on what I had spent the last four years looking for in Arizona. So I was making images that uh, um, I was kind of dist I wasn't trying to figure out exactly what this street was or if it was of some importance or if that mountain had some other meaning. I was working completely visual with a place and trying to make a connection back to my America and what I remember from there. And I, I was not putting any pressure on myself and um, the curator, she was fantastic, but she kept asking me, she says, you know, what's your project about? You can give me like a title, I gotta put together a press release, and in every little town I was in, they would organize a little interview with a newspaper, and they kept wanting like, you know, the catchphrase. I'm photographing the rice culture. I'm photographing um, the kids. I'm photographing um, whatever, and I kept, a little bit out of frustra frustration, I said, you know what, the title of my project is called Not Nigata. And the idea that I'm, I'm put in this place with a bit of a pressure to make a picture about a place. And my idea was that I, I, don't, I don't really believe in that. I don't think that I can make a, a true, authentic picture of the place. All I can do is make my picture of the place and it'll be fantastic pictures, but it won't be Nagata. And that, that became like this confusing moment um, when it's going through a translator, trying to tell somebody that I'm not gonna be making pictures uh, of Niigata when they just paid a lot of money for me to go there and make pictures in Niigata. But, th but the way of working was very, very similar. I would knock on doors, people would introduce me to people, set up a few soft lights inside if I needed to, and um, in the end it's only 36 pictures. Like I only photographed for 19 days, which is um, pretty good. But it came time to do the book, a lot of people asked, well, why don't you go back? You could keep going. And that would have been exactly the wrong way to do it, because if I would have gone back, I would have started researching, I would have started to try and like really tell the story of Niigata, and it would have become something different. So it's even in the text in the book, it, it's, it's concentrated on the fact of this, is, this all happened in a short amount of time, very intense, sort of like a, you know, um, you know, a fish, you just sort of dive in quickly and grab something and leave. And, uh, You know, this image, if this, if this was in Higley, Arizona, I would have made this image as well. And, uh, 
Yeah, this, this was one of the last images I made, and it was quite funny. I'd met this man, young man, outside of town a few weeks, or a few days before, and um, he was very interested in America, and he knew I was an American, and we were talking, and he said, I'm getting married, and I'm getting married in an American-style wedding, and would you be my wedding photographer? And I, th and I, I, I was traveling, I had Gore-Tex pants, a Gore-Tex jacket, I had these boots, and a backpack, and I, and I, and I didn't, hadn't shaved in the time, I looked terrible, and I said, you know, this is, this is all I've got, I mean, I, this is all I've got, and he's like, perfect, he's like, He's like, my, my, he's like my, my, the wedding is going to be so like stuffy and, and he's like, you got to be there and bring your big camera and uh, you got him. And I'm thinking, oh, okay, he, I'm going to do it then. And um, I showed up there looking, I, I don't have it with me. I made a snapshot of myself in the elevator going up to the super fancy high rise building. And I'm just standing there and I look like I've been walking around Japan for three weeks. And... I walked in and, and you could tell there were certain parts of his family that were like a little nervous and he was all excited that something else was going on. And so I set up the camera and then everybody left the room and there was this weird moment where he was standing there and I was standing here and it seemed to take forever because we couldn't really communicate. His English wasn't very good and of course I spoke no Japanese. And he just stood there, you know, waiting and waiting. And here he is at this moment, like this most important, pivotal point in his life. And I'm the only guy in the room with him thinking, how does this, how does this happen? This is, um, this is so abstract. So I, I put the film in the camera and I took this picture. And this is the one that, then I took my little G10 Canon point and shoot and I photographed his wedding. And he, I gave him a CD and he has all these snapshots. But I sent him this, this one picture as well. This is the, the one that for me ended up in the series. And, and um, I think, it, yeah, it's the last one I have of that. So I like this way of just sort of roaming through a community that I didn't understand, and, and suddenly I ended up at this boy's wedding, and, uh, and, and I got to share this, this really monumental moment with him, and um, uh, yeah. I, I want to finish then, those are the, the three or four sort of what I consider like the bigger books that I'm interested in doing, and because this is kind of a photo book fair, I want to end with one of my self-published projects, because it ends with a family snapshot, so it'll all kind of come around again. Um, a very conceptual project. I was um, the new Photohof in Salzburg, next to the new Photohof, there's a high-rise building, and I, w I wanted to go up in that building to get a view of the construction of Photohof. And while I, was, while I was in there, I stumbled upon, on the seventh floor, just by chance, a bunch of kids had broken in to this um, office building, and they'd used sort of power tools and with very um, skilled labor, they had built a skate park out of the, out of all the office, office furniture, the doors, they'd taken the doors down, they'd, they'd built these ramps. And what I have to say is I'm, a, um, when I was a teenager, I was a fanatic skateboarder. And I kind of gave up skateboarding when I started photographing. That became sort of my new passion. And um, this is also going to go full circle with Robert Adams because I, I, de I dedicated this project to Robert Adams and Mike McGill. There might only be a few people who know Mike McGill is, but he's an old school skateboarder who was never really flashy. He was always like cool and smooth. He was sort of the Robert Adams of skateboarding. And I thought, I was also like Robert Adams because I wasn't really good, but I, was, I tried to be like quiet and cool. And my photography is a bit like that. I try to be a little, a little quieter, a little bit reduced. And so I did this little project always thinking about Robert Adams and Mike McGill and the idea of, okay, here I am standing behind the camera getting super excited to make this picture in the same way that when I was 16 years old, I would have been super excited to fly through these rooms and like fly off some ramp. And um, it became this, this um, little abstract place for me that I only got to visit twice before yeah, it sort of all got closed down, and you couldn't get in there anymore. And um, that's even where the title comes from. This was written on the wall. The kids would write down the names of the skateboard tricks to kind of, to the way they would remember what they were. And 720 is um, a, a double 360. And I like this duality, Robert Adams, Mike McGill, skateboarding photography. Um, so as I was doing on this, I kept sending it to my old um, skateboard friend. That, this is, this is the only picture where you see Salzburg. This is the uh, Hotel Europa and um, the Heizkraftwerk. And um, as I was doing this, I kept sending them to an old friend of mine who I used to skateboard with. And um, we would talk about it and sort of reminisce about old times. Um, so he went through his archives. I'll get through this first. Not very many pictures. I think there's only 15 pictures. 
Um, it, it be, I decided to make a little artist book. I only made 100 copies. I wish now I would have made more, but it's okay. They're, they're off in the world doing their thing. And it kind of feels like an office product. When I was getting ready to make it, I was at the digital printers in Salzburg, and I had the layout, but I didn't know how to do the binding. And uh, the guy at the digital printing place, he, just, he said, let's not think about the binding, let's look at paper. And he reached into the um, wall, and he pulled out a book of paper samples. And it was, this is exactly what it looked like. And I thought, that's exactly it. It, it. it feels like an office product. It feels like you could sort of find this thing kind of laying off in this, you know, in this shelf back here. Um, I got a couple pictures of the book um, because I, I don't have any more. It's been, the whole thing's been reproduced in sort of a newspaper um, for a gallery in Linz. Well, my friend found a picture of me skateboarding in uh, 1988. So I thought um, that's a great way to kind of end the book and also uh, to kind of end the whole talk here, that um, again, even though I wasn't planning it, again, this, this sort of personal family snapshot found its way back into the work. And uh, yeah, I talk a little bit about um, dedicating the whole thing to, to Robert Adams and Mike McGill, both people at one point in my life inspired me and excited me for different reasons. Um, yeah, my wife calls it my midlife crisis book, but uh, <laughs> it's, it's um, but I, know I never took my skateboard there. I was worried that if I crashed or something, no one would ever find me. But, um, but I do still have a skateboard. Um, yeah, I think I would stop there. No, they, no, no, they were never there because the police had already been there and sort of kicked them out. About a half a year later, I was showing it at the Fachhochschule, and some kids in the class were so excited that they said, that's us, we built that. You know, can we, so I, I didn't have any more books, but I gave each of them a, a small print because they, they said, yeah, the police kicked us out, we couldn't get back. I was able to get in simply because, you know, it was during the day and I was there as a photographer, but um, I think I'll stop there. Good, it's hot.